that, we'll go ahead and get started. First, I'd like to thank everybody for coming out. It's, it's a good turnout, and I um, guess kind of get right into it here. So today we have a special guest, Dr. Ken Kane. Uh, Ken is originally from Michigan, uh, where he received his master's at Michigan State in aquaculture. Excuse me, and in 1997, he finished his PhD at Washington State University um, in fish health and immunology. And he's currently a professor at the uh, University of Idaho, and he ho also holds an administrative appointment as the associate director of UI's Aquaculture Research Institute. So, busy man. Um, so his primary research uh, interests focus on defining the immune system in fish and developing vaccines and other tools to combat important fish diseases. Um, he's also uh, worked on wild and hatchery fish and holds uh, patents for new tools for use in controlling or diagnosing diseases in fish. Uh, but beyond this, he also has some research, research interest uh, in developing a conservation aquaculture methods for new species uh, to aid in the recovery of natural populations, which is what he's going to talk to us about today. So with further ado, I'll turn it over. Great. Thanks, Carlos. I appreciate it. And I probably should just sent you a little shorter intro, maybe it would have been easier, but <laughs> but I, th I thank you for that intro. And I really do appreciate the invite to come here and, and talk about some of the things that, that I've been involved with for the last decade or so at the University of Idaho. And um, yeah, and I think Carlos, I have to give him credit and everybody who's who I've had a chance to meet with today. It's been really nice and, uh, and well organized. And uh, yeah, and I thought I would uh, present some material related to the conservation side of the aquaculture development programs that we have at the university. And, and, uh, and it's working with a, a relatively unique species that a lot of people haven't really heard about. And uh, do you think we can turn the lights down maybe a little bit, uh, just so some of these pictures come? Come up. Right there. Yeah. Ah, there we go. Cool. That's probably perfect. Okay, excellent. No, I mean the one there. Oh, uh, that's it. Is that better, you guys? Yeah. Good. Excellent. Okay, so I titled this Conservation Aquaculture as a Critical Tool for Recovery of Native Fish Populations. And so I'll, I'll kind of give you a well, one example before we get into this, and uh, does, does anybody know what this species of fish is? Burbot, good, okay. So it's essentially a freshwater cod. So, so I'm going to focus most of the talk on that species, but I think really you, you, if you ask the question of how can threatened and endangered fish populations be effectively restored, you've got a few different things that you can do to achieve that type of a goal. And one of those may center around habitat restoration, and in many places that could work, depending on uh, what's, what the specifics are behind the population that you're looking at. Uh, you can restrict harvest. That's usually one of the first things that managers will do in agencies is they'll restrict harvest or eliminate harvest. Um, you can change anthropogenic factors. In the West, we have a lot of dams and a lot of issues there. Sometimes that's politically impossible to change those types of factors. Uh, and then you can also look at enhancing or supplementing those populations to try to begin to restore them. And to do that, oftentimes we use aquaculture as a tool. And this typically uh, focuses on culturing that species and then releasing it with the hopes that they will naturally reproduce at some point and begin to rebuild the natural population. And so that's kind of the goal of a lot of the conservation aquaculture programs. So the area that we've been working in and, and, and the reason we're working in this area is because of the Kootenai tribe of Idaho. So we work with some of the Native American tribes in the West. And this is, uh, if you look at it, we got Washington State here, Oregon, Idaho, and then British Columbia and Montana here. And this whole area is part of the Columbia River drainage. So essentially the Mississippi of the West. And you've got all these, these dots or dams that are on those systems. But we work in this area up here. The Kootenai River flows from British Columbia into Montana and through a little sliver corner of Idaho back, back into British Columbia. And then it connects with some of the headwater areas of the Columbia River and flows out. 
And so the Kootenai Tribe of Idaho is a small tribe that's located in northern Idaho, and they've had interest in restoring some of their fish populations. The first um, species that they've worked with is the Kootenai River white sturgeon, and this sturgeon was historically very abundant in that section of the river. Uh, it grew to very large sizes, over a thousand pounds in some cases, and these are some historic pictures of that species. And so it was petitioned and listed uh, through the Endangered Species Act as an endangered species because it had been landlocked for over 10,000 years and there was very little reproduction. So the Kootenai tribe initiated a conservation aquaculture program for these white sturgeon back in 1992, I believe. And they, they essentially, they'll go out, they'll collect wild sturgeon from the river uh, and they'll bring those in in the springtime right before spawning. Uh, and then they will hold them for a period of time. They'll monitor the eggs until they are ovulated. And then they will spawn um, those adults. They'll rear the progeny up for a period of time and they will release a portion of those progeny back into the river. They've been doing that since 1992, I believe. It was the first releases that they had. And so that program has been very, very successful, except sturgeon take over 20 years to mature in that system, so they don't really know if there has been any reproduction yet because those first releases are just now getting old enough to actually uh, potentially reproduce in the river. But about 10 years ago, there was another species that was culturally important to the tribe, and this was bourbon. And in the wintertime, these fish spawn, and they congregate in areas, and so it was, a, it was a good food source in the wintertime for the tribe. So they wanted to take some of the same, uh, look at some of the same techniques that they've implemented for white sturgeon and, and adapt that to this species as well. The problem was is nobody had really done much work with this species as far as raising it in a hatchery setting or culturing it in captivity. So what I want to do today is give you a little bit of background on burbot and talk to you a little bit about the status of the species in the Kootenai River system in North Idaho and British Columbia, and then talk about this project sort of as a whole, which began for us back in 2003. Uh, some of the goals, the objectives, and then the results, and really it's, it's kind of been broken down into about three phases, phase one, two, and three, and then I'll, I'll end with some of the highlight some of the releases that we've had of some of these hatchery reared vertebrate into both Canada and U.S., so the Canadian portion of the river as well as the U.S., and essentially going through taking these fish from um, the, the brood stock stage through to larval rearing, um, try, the techniques we've had to implement to get them onto some sort of a feed to be able to raise them to a size large enough to release, and then ultimately uh, the release of these fish into the river. And so the biology of this species, they're essentially the only freshwater gadidae. So they're freshwater cod, and they have an indirect life history strategy. So they have a true larval form. They're, they're similar to marine, a lot of marine species. Um, in, uh, in Iowa here, you produce a lot of walleye uh, for stocking purposes. Uh, they have a larval stage similar to a walleye, except a bit, they're a bit smaller when they hatch. Uh, they, the adult forms mature in about three to four years, so they don't, certainly don't take as long as sturgeon. So from the tribe standpoint, this was a species they may see some, some actual natural reproduction if they got fish into the river. Um, they're a communal spawner, so they spawn in the wintertime. They're highly piscivorous. And the larvae, when they hatch, they're about three to four millimeters in size, so they're smaller than a walleye. Um, they hatch without a mouth, and they're, in, they're highly planktivorous. So essentially, you've got fertilized eggs, larval stage, and then you've got ju age zero juveniles that look similar to adults through the subadult stage. Their natural spawning, they tend to spawn in aggregations and they term these spawning balls. And so this is a picture here, if you can see on the right, uh, of one of these spawning balls. So if you have a female that uh, is ovulating and ripe and, and uh, ready to spawn, a lot of the males will move in and form these big, large aggregations, under, oftentimes under the ice. So the season that they spawn, typically early February to mid-February is when you actually will collect spawning fish. And the temperature range at what they spawn is zero to five degrees C. So if you know anything about uh, fish culture, this is a challenge to get systems down this cold oftentimes. Uh, they spawn in the natural systems under low-velocity areas over coarse substrate. 
the eggs of these fish are about a millimeter in diameter on average. Um, if, they're, if they're fertilized, uh, they don't swell up as much as if they're unfertilized. So you can go through and, and, and look at your fertilization rates early <coughs> on. But the size range is about 0.7 to 1.4 millimeters. Uh, when they spawn, they're semi-buoyant eggs, so they'll, they'll float in the water column for a while and then they'll settle out. And again, the optimal temperatures are around 0 to 5 degrees C. If you're incubating these eggs for very long and you exceed 5 degrees C, oftentimes you'll have pretty high mortalities in the eggs. And they hatch at about uh, 110 degree days. And so at these types of temperatures, that's over a month. So about, about 40 or more days before they start to hatch. So it's quite a long period of time. The larvae, as I mentioned earlier, they're about three to four millimeters in size. And this is a picture of the egg and then the, the larval burbot right after hatch. And you can see they're, um, they essentially don't have a mouth when they, when they hatch. And it takes about 10 days for this mouth to develop at those temperatures. They're extremely fragile. Uh, and in just designing systems to hold these, if you don't have screens that are 400 microns in size, they'll get through them typically. So it's, it's a challenge. Anyways, um, so if you look at the larval size, you know, they'll start out, you, you have to start them out feeding them some sort of plankton, so typically artemia or brine shrimp. And then you can, once they get up a little bit larger, you can start to try to adapt them to some sort of a more available commercial type diet. If you look at the distribution of burbot, uh, they're essentially a northern hemisphere uh, species, uh, their circumpolar distribution. There's an Asian subspecies uh, called Loda Loda Loda, and then the North American subspecies that they've looked at genetically, and they term that Loda Loda Maculosa, it is the is the two distinct subspecies, and they occur all the way up through Alaska and then across through Russia and Siberia and northern Asia as well. Okay, burbot in Idaho. Uh, the only place that they're found in the entire state, which the state spans for probably about 600 miles from the Canadian border all the way down to the border of Utah in Nevada. And the only place they occur is in this corner area where the Kootenai River flows through. And this population was considered imperiled uh, in the mid-90s. Uh, and Idaho Fish and Game, uh, which is our, our DNR agency there, had done a lot of work in estimating the population. In the late 90s, their, their capture rates and their estimates uh, essentially said that within that Idaho portion of the river, there were less than about 50 burbot left, adult burbot in that system, and there wasn't any natural reproduction in there. So the population was essentially functionally extinct. Uh, the reason for this, it's due to some types of anthropogenic or habitat alterations. Uh, Libby Dam in Montana was constructed and completed in 1975. And even before that, this area, which is high agriculture, there's a lot of hop production in there from, uh, I think Anheuser-Busch owns a lot of property in that area. And they've channelized the river quite a bit uh, for flooding reasons as well. Uh, and they've eliminated a lot of the floodplain uh, and off-channel habitat. And the systems become very essentially hyper-oligotrophic, um, not a lot of nutrients in it. And then water temperature fluctuations, which are probably a result of mm -hmm. dam operations in the wintertime, do not typically get down to the, the low temperatures that the species needs uh, to reproduce effectively. And so those are some of, the, some of the, the theories behind why this population has plummeted so much. So, and there was a lot of publications in this. Uh, Vaughn Paragamian, who was actually at Iowa State for a while, uh, he worked for Idaho Fish and Game, and he sort of documented a lot of the, the collapse of this fishery early on. And so essentially, they're functionally extinct. If you look at a um, graph of, tip of traditional harvest all the way back into the late 60s and catch per unit hour, um, there used to be a commercial fishery in this, in the British Columbia, in the, the lake. They've caught as many as 26,000 fish in that fishery um, back in the this early 70s, late 60s. And then it, 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 it pretty much plummeted. And after Libby Dam went in, the population dropped to next to nothing. And so uh, by the end of the 80s, 
uh, it was very difficult to find a fish and harvest restrictions were put on that population in the early 90s. So to restore this population, the Kootenai tribe set out and really worked with the community up there, which uh, isn't always the case with some of these. Uh, but their goal is to really restore a, a viable, self-sustaining, but harvestable, po harvestable population uh, in the lower Kootenai River. And they've developed a conservation strategy to look at how to, to make this happen, essentially. So they worked with some of the, um, uh, the community uh, as well as the agencies involved. And this, because it borders British Columbia, was also an international effort. And they developed a conservation strategy. And as part of that conservation strategy, they really recognized that um, aquaculture development was probably one of the key, going to be one of the key factors if they were going to recover this population. And so this was done essentially right around uh, 2000. And they had their tribal sturgeon facility there. So they did try to bring some fish in uh, to that tribal hatchery. Uh, and 2000 and 2001, and they spawned some adults in that facility, and they produced a few larvae, uh, but there were no juvenile fish that survived. And these were, were fish they brought in right at the time of spawning, uh, but they didn't have any success with those larvae. They had all sorts of issues. So in 2003, they, um, or just prior to 2003, they contacted the university and, and wanted to work with us on trying to develop some of these aquaculture techniques. And so, uh, we started working with them essentially at the end of 2003. So again, this is a, a conservation strategy and essentially we're talking about a feasibility program as part of the initial efforts. And it's multi-agency, the Kootenai tribe. It was funded through Bonneville Power Administration. And if you're not familiar with the West, uh, Bonneville Power funds a lot of fish research, mostly on salmon, but a little bit on sturgeon and other species. Um, also, the British Columbia Ministry of the Environment, Idaho Fish and Game, Fish and Wildlife Service was involved, as well as the University of Idaho. And the primary goal, at least initially, was really just to determine if burbot could be brought into captivity, spawn, and we could begin to rear the progeny. So pretty simple initial um, goals for the project. So in November of 2003, wild fish were captured. And if you look at the, the graph or the um, diagram down here, you see the British Columbia border. We had to get uh, broodstock from British Columbia. So we actually had to go into British Columbia. And there were a few different lakes, uh, Duncan Lake, Arrow Reservoir. And then now we get our fish over here in a lake called Moye Lake, which, which flows into the Kootenai River uh, upstream of the recovery areas. So anyways, we brought fish in transported them to the, to the University of Idaho and the Aquaculture Institute. And we transitioned these adults um, and mimicked the photo period and the temperature that we would find in North Idaho. Okay. And then we started to look at some of the initial objectives. So some of the initial objectives in this phase one part of the project were to test various methods for spawning fish. Um, we also wanted to apply and develop some preservation techniques, crowd preservation techniques for uh, the semen from fish as well, just in case they were able to go back to the founder population in, in the Kootenai and they would want to crowd preserve uh, milk for some genetics work later on because uh, this is something that's done quite a bit in some of the uh, salmon recovery programs out there where they'll crowd preserve semen and then they can use that in subsequent years to spawn fish to keep the genetic diversity up. So and then we'll, we wanted to evaluate methods for incubating eggs and then explore larval as well as juvenile feeding strategies so we could raise, so we could get fish to the size where they could be tagged and released back into the river. So we got these fish in in November. We really didn't know if they were males or females. We couldn't tell the difference between a male and a female burbot. So we talked to the vet school at Washington State, which is about seven miles from the university. And they had a, uh, radio, or a ultrasound technologist there that had worked with the salmon industry in Norway. And he said, yeah, we can ultrasound fish. So we came over and we ultrasound burbot. And I thought, ah, there's no way we're going to be able to tell anything. So here's a picture of, here's an ultrasound picture of, of uh, a 
sexually mature vertebrate, or two sexually mature vertebrate. Does anybody know which one's the male and which one's the female? Yeah. Take a guess. Right. Anybody? Female. Female this side? Yeah. Good job. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so this is the male and this is the female. And I would have never been able to tell the difference between the two. But after about three fish, four fish maybe, he was like, oh yeah, this is easy. And he'd just get the, the wand next to him and he could tell us. And he was 100% correct. So the first year, we had seven males and 13 females. So we only had 20 fish in that first year. And again, we had to address this question of would these fish even spawn in captivity? So that was one of the first questions. And we had to invest in chillers that would take the water temperature in our systems down. So we can see it's about three degrees C here, and it takes a lot of energy to, to, to bring water temperatures down that low, even in the middle of winter in Idaho. Uh, and we, we successfully got fish to spawn. So we could, we could gather eggs, we would collect milk from the males, and then we set up and looked at, at incubation systems and um, how successful we could be as far as hatching these eggs out. Part of the problem was finding an incubator system that would work really well with those pelagic eggs, and there's some out there. Um, so we tested some incubators, uh, standard McDonald jars, which are used with um, salmonid and other species, and these pelagic egg incubators that we got, and then these just upwelling Imhoff cones, which are used for water quality testing a lot of times, and we would, we would rig them up so that the water would upwell through them. Uh, we tested that, we got ripe eggs, we were able to uh, incubate these eggs for a period of time and we had we had fish hatch and and uh, I remember I had a master student on this project at the time and he would say oh we got all kinds of larvae hatching out and you got to come over and see them and I'd get over there the next day and I'd be like okay where's all the larvae and and at that time we didn't know how easy these things would get out of every every tank that we could put them in so we, that's when we had to, we found out we had to use 400 micron screens and everything so we, we hatched fish, but we also lost a lot of fish the first year. So after this, I think this was in the second year, we had enough fish to do some feeding experiments. We looked at larval rearing. And unlike a lot of species, and most of us were familiar with raising um, salmon and trout, uh, you had to start with live feed. So we would actually start with raising rotifers in the lab, which are very tiny plankton. We could enrich those with different algaes and, um, and fatty acids and they would take those up, you could feed those to the larvae. Then we would move to brine shrimp or artemia, and then we would try to move into a dry diet. And, the, and we would implement some marine cod diets that were available because uh, there was some work being done on cod culture, especially in the East Coast and, and overseas. So we would set up a, a typical rearing timeline, and those initial phases, we would have this rotifer phase and artemia phase, and then we would try to mix them and do a transition and then juvenile grow out. But you can see, we'd start with up to seven million eggs. Uh, we would lose a lot of those. We'd have two or three mil or one or two million that would hatch and, and in these initial stages, and we begin to feed larvae. That would go down, and then by the end of August, early September, we would have transition juveniles. And that has ranged anywhere from 2,000 to 20,000, depending on the year and the success. Uh, in the first year, we had four. We had four fish survive. So, <laughs> so we had a learning curve at first. Um, and this is some of the live feed culture. This is growing up the, the various artemia. And then this recently, we've switched over to some of these, uh, these larger type incubation systems. And then we could actually have a valve that we can collect them periodically, uh, and that works a lot better for our chemia production. So the primary program results were that we had a captive breeding program that uh, we could initiate, and it was feasible to rear or to at least spawn these fish in captivity. We, we did some preliminary work on that. We looked at larval feeding methods and regimes, and we also developed some ways to crowd preserve the semen, which I don't really have time to talk about, but it was successful for the most part. And then the sort of the phase two of the program was to look at some secondary objectives. You know, how do you begin to optimize some of these, these different methods? So we looked at optimizing incubation methods. We also wanted to characterize some of the um, issues with things like disease susceptibility because there's always this concern that you bring a, a, a species into captivity that you're gonna have disease problems. 
Uh, in that area, they're mainly worried about some of the trout and salmon diseases, so they wanted, you know, there was a need or a concern to test the susceptibility of burbot against some of the trout and salmon diseases. Uh, and then we also wanted to investigate some alternative rearing methods, such as uh, semi-intensive pond culture for larval stages, which is done with walleye and, and yellow perch. And then ultimately we would initiate some experimental releases at this stage. So, so some of the op optimizing the egg incubation methods, oftentimes this dealt with, or this focused on dealing with things like fungal, um, in infestations on the eggs. So as soon as you incubate eggs, and especially when you keep them around for 40 plus days in the incubator, you'll begin to get fungal problems on those eggs. And they can quickly suffocate the egg and you get no, uh, no hatch or very limited hatches. So we just investigated standard methods of using either formalin or hydrogen peroxide to disinfect those eggs. We set up some really neat little um, test systems where we could replicate it in 50 mil centrifuge tubes and we could put 5 mils or 5,000 eggs in there because we got about 1,000 eggs per mil and we could test different methods in replicate, replicated systems. And what we found was that we could control fungus with um, either hydroperoxide or formalin uh, pretty readily and we worked on the disease susceptibility uh, aspects and uh, looked at a number of viruses as well as bacteria and found that for the most part if you compare, especially if you compared to mortality that you would see in trout or salmon, uh, these fish were pretty refractory. They, they did get infected with a, a one virus as well as a, a bacteria or two, but the mortality levels were really, really low. And then we also investigated this alternative rearing um, and we, we had these ponds that were large um, 12 foot circular ponds that we had put in the ground at our facility and we sort of called this a semi-intensive tank, but we could run these static, we could seed them with zooplankton and have them sort of as a natural pond, but not exactly. Um, and we could look at the feasibility and we could put larvae in these and we'd get really nice um, looking larvae out of these ponds, very healthy, but we'd have to get them quickly before they ate up everything that was in there and bring them in and transition them to feed. Uh, if you look at these pictures, this is some other issues that we had. So what are wrong, what's wrong with these pictures? So one of them, you can see there's a mouth sticking out there. And then this here, if you look at the fins of this little larvae, this is where a larvae got ingested but then regurgitated. So you'd get secondary mortality because his brother couldn't quite eat him completely. And cannibalism was an issue. And so in the larval, um, stages when you would wean them from a live feed to a dry feed, it was it was a big issue, but it could be an issue even in larger fish as well. So, <laughs> this is one of the original uh, when they brought fish into the tri tribal program from the wild in the original years. They had these fish in a tank, and they were trying to feed them rainbow trout at the time, and they weren't feeding them at high enough rate. So they came in one day, and this guy had engulfed his brother here, or his relative, I think, and and they both died at that point. So. so we had to implement some grading systems to be able to separate the sizes of fish. So we used a little mesh grading boxes where we could put fish, put larvae in there, let them passively grade themselves out depending on the mesh size. And that worked pretty good. We could flow water through there and we could separate different sizes. Um, we have to work on getting them pretty uniform though. And this is some of the early experiment stuff where we'd have a control that we were un was ungraded uh, of, of larvae at the weaning stage. We'd have some that could, uh, that didn't swim through the grader. So these were the high grades, the larger fish. We'd have some that were low grades that swam through the smaller fish. And you can see they're pretty uniform in size. And then after just 15 days, you could look at the population. And you can see the controls, there was a lot less fish than there were in either the high grades or the low grades. And these fish were pretty evenly distributed. So that was good. That looked really, really promising and we reduced our mortality by quite, quite a bit. Then we looked at some larger fi fish that we tried to um, grade. And these are ones that were the high grades, but there was a little more disparity and variation in the size to begin with. And if you look closely, this is the beginning of the experiment. We had these high grades and most of them are pretty uniform, but there's a couple fish in there that were quite a bit bigger at the start. And so after 15 days, there were also two larger fish in that population, but there were only three other fish that remained after just 15 days in there. So they're very effective at cannibalizing each other when they want to. Okay, so 
anyways, we've done we've done a lot of that preliminary work, and we've we've optimized various aspects of it. And in 2009, we were able to get the permits in place to release the first fish um, in both. British Columbia as well as in Ida the Idaho portion of the Kootenai River and so we got a little bit of press on this at that time and these some of these first fish as well we put radio transmitters in they were all tagged with pit tags so that we could come back uh, and uh, recapture those fish and see how well they were doing if they weren't pit tagged we would put little elastomer tags in the fins of these fish as well too so you could see them uh, later on so so those experimental releases were were Pretty successful in 2009. We only had about 250 fish then at four different locations. 2010, we had about 2,100 fish, and we would put these these um, additional fish that were larger and uh, earlier year classes that were implanted with uh, radio transmitters. We put those in as well, and we saw these fish would go 200 kilometers north into the north end of the lake in British Columbia, or 200 kilometers. Um, east up into the into the uh, Montana past the Montana border as well within a matter of months after we released them and nobody expected that so so there's a lot of ongoing monitoring looking at those things so just as kind of summary for this is you can see since 2009 this is our cumulative mortality we put over 60,000 burbot into the Kootenai River as tag juveniles and then we've also put in another about 400,000 larvae into the into the river and they're they're doing really well and the recapture rates are pretty high. So right now sort of the phase three is just the continuing this production and we've, we've got a winter spawning season. We actually go up to British Columbia to one of the lakes where the population is. We angle for these fish through the ice. We spawn them on the ice and then we bring the eggs back down to the university and incubate those um, through till about the end of March, early April. And then in the spring, we do the larval rearing so eggs to larvae, and then we transition to feed and grow those fish up until about October. So we'll be releasing fish in another couple of weeks here from this last year's. So in the summer season, we do the grow out, and then in the fall, we release fish at five to 10 grams or so in size. So this is just some pictures of gamete collection. So since 2010, we've been getting all of our um, our eggs from fish that we collect on the ice up in, up in BC at the lakes. And we, as you can see, we spawn those fish right on the ice. Uh, we monitor them. We've worked out some techniques so if the fish isn't completely ripe, we can put it in a tube, drop it back down under the ice, come back a day or two later and check it and see if it's ripe. And that's worked pretty well. Um, you know, there's some pretty nice days out there collecting in, in the middle of February. It's not too bad uh, most of the time. Uh, but it can be quite miserable at other times, too. So. So the future directions of this program are really to continue some of the experimental releases um, and monitor really at this point what the population is doing in the river. We've got fish out there now that should be, that are of spawning age. Um, we've seen with radio transmitters that they're congregating in traditional areas where they used to spawn. We haven't, we haven't necessarily caught any larvae to show that they've spawned, but, um, but everybody's pretty, pretty happy with what's happening so far. And all this has been done because the Kootenai tribe um, had, had gained the funding to build a new hatchery to expand their sturgeon work as well as do burbot work up there. So, they, so our goal was to transfer this technology to this new tribal hatchery. And the grand opening was actually yesterday for this facility. So this next year, we'll, they'll be doing a lot of the culture themselves, and we'll probably do some backup culture for it. But the goal is just really to recover this sustainable and a, you know, a harvestable population in that system. And so this is an example of when it's a really crummy day out on the mm -hmm. ice when we're, we're catching fish. And uh, I thought I'd kind of leave you with that. And then I'd also leave you with this. I told you that these fish form these spawning balls or spawning aggregations. And this is a video of about 10 minutes of a spawning ball that's condensed in about 30 seconds. And you can see there was a female that came in here that was ripe. And then you'd get these males that would start to move in. And you could see this under the ice. We had video cameras down there. And you can see how many fish congregate in a short period of time around this. And the fishing was really good for a short period of time <laughs> over top of it. Great.
So again, just reiterating that this has been a really large scale, um, multi-agency type of project that includes international as well as national collaborations. And the funding has, has been mostly through Bonneville Power, a little bit for Fish and Wildlife Service, and then the tribe um, has been really good to work with. And with that, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer. Yeah, you mentioned you started with about 50 fish. We started that first year with 20 adults, yeah. Uh -huh. Well, I'm just interested because down at uh, Death Valley National Park, there's a uh, devil's hole pub fish in a really restricted environment. Mm -hmm. And they, they have about 50 fish. Oh, yeah, so in the river, there was probably less than 50 fish. We couldn't really get our hands on those very well, though, because they're so dispersed. But pupfish would be very, would be different. Yeah. So I'm wondering, who's going to have more success or have an easier time bringing back their fish? You know, a <laughs> devil's hole with a one little hole and a big fish tank they just built, or, a, you know, an open system with rivers and all, all the rest of it? That's a good question. I mean, I think every system, no matter what you're trying to do, it's very dynamic. And, and there's, and we still don't know if this is going to work until we get some, some data on whether, and there's a lot of things involved, so I haven't even touched on the political aspects of this because a lot of it really centers around whether you can get the dam operations to maintain minimal flows for the entire period of time that those fish are going to spawn, so the temperature needs to be below 5 degrees C, plus the entire time those eggs are incubating. So there's a period of time that they need to maintain minimum flows so those temperatures can get that low. And as soon as they get a call for power, boom, there's a spike in, in river flows. So those are issues that we'll probably deal with. As far as the pupfish, I'm not sure. What sort, of, what sort of things are they implementing to try to recover that population? Are they culturing them or not? Yeah, they're going to start to culture the little desert pupfish. Mm -hmm. And they built up like a $1 million fish tank wow. to, to replicate their home environment. Hmm. And uh, there's some folks in Nevada who thought that was a lot of money to spend on a fish tank. <laughs> <laughs> well, so it's the politics, yes. The politics. Really and, and, and one thing that was really key, actually, that, that allowed us to do some of this work and to use the population that wasn't in the river itself, because it was hard to get your hands on those fish, so we're using the next closest relatives just up the drainage in British Columbia, was the fact that these fish were petitioned for ESA listing, but they didn't get listed because there wasn't enough genetic information on them. And so, from the state standpoint, that's the last thing they want is an ESA listed species. So they were supportive, the governor was supportive, and that helped also them to implement these and get the permits needed to collect fish from elsewhere, because otherwise we probably would have been restricted with the numbers of fish we could start with. And the 50 pupfish is an issue from a genetic standpoint if you're going to have inbreeding issues down the road, and that's another thing that could be a problem. So. Other questions? Yeah. So as a as a hatchery person, our, one of our biggest battles is disease in the hatchery. Um, and so as technology has progressed, we have recirculating aquaculture systems. And more agencies are starting to adapt to that technology. I would like to adapt to that too. Um, administrators have said to me, well, Alan, you know, and I'm saying we can eliminate all these disease problems that we have by using one of these systems. And they'll come back and say, well, you know, those fish are going to be naive when you stock them into the wild. And they're going to be susceptible to all these diseases because they haven't seen them all. I don't think that's quite true. No, what were your thoughts on that? Oh, uh, it's definitely not true. Um, I think actually research systems, you're more likely to have a disease problem in a research system than you are in a flow through system depending on your water source. I mean, it, obviously, if you're getting surface water or river water as a source and you're not disinfecting it prior to seeing fish, then a flow-through system is going to have more problems. But research, when you do have a problem, it's a lot harder to get rid of that problem, for sure. But from the standpoint of fish being naive when you release them, usually, unless you're releasing very, very small larval fish, they, their immune system is much more developed by the time you release them, so they shouldn't have those issues down the road like they would um, 
if you were releasing them in a much smaller size. So I think it's more an aspect of age and size in your success down the road than them being naive or not. Yeah, that's for sure. And there's certain diseases that they're going to see on a regular basis no matter what. And if they're not under stress, then they're not going to have problems with them. But if if they are, they're going to have problems. And there's certain exotic diseases that if they see, it's not going to matter whether they're stressed or not, and they're going to have problems. So, yeah, I, I don't buy that argument either. That's for sure. Do you have any insight into why that population is doing so poorly when all of our surrounding populations seem to be doing much better? Well, I think most of it boils down to the habitat issues. Um, there's two main things, you know, and, and, and even some of the populations up in BC are not doing well. They've implemented some harvest restrictions on most of their populations over the last couple of years. But that particular population in the Kootenai seems to be linked to the channelization as well as the, um, the Libby Dam issue and the, and the temperature issue because there just wasn't any recruitment into the population after that dam went in. And then the, the fact that they channelized it, they used to have a lot of off-channel bays that would warm up, a lot of, have a lot of uh, plankton production during the period of time that these larvae were maturing. Now it's just like a, it's, yeah, it's just like a diked system. And it's, and the, even the bottom has changed and the species composition has changed. There's a lot of um, suckers and other fish that really we didn't have a, a, you know, their assemblage wasn't that great before that can prey on the larvae at those early times too. So, so there's a combination of things and issues and they've got an entire habitat restoration program linked with this and the sturgeon um, program that's trying to address most of those issues as well too. And just a follow up too, have you seen increases in catch rates in the system since you started stocking? Yeah, it's interesting. It's good. I'm glad you asked that because um, we got some pretty good numbers from Idaho Fishing Game last year. They have been recapturing the fish that we've put out there at a pretty, a pretty impressive rate. In fact, um, they're thinking that if they can continue the, the release levels that they have the last few years, um, that it's possible that they could even implement some sort of a um, catch program on these fish within the next five years or so. Uh, with at least the hatchery portion of them. And then the fish that have been radio transmitted or transmit, have put radio transmitters in, they'll be able to map those fish into some of these spawning areas. They've also got pit tag arrays in some of the tributaries, so they've released some fish in the tributaries and they can see when they migrate in and out. And they had some evidence last year that they had an adult pass one of these arrays going up the tributary, which apparently they used to tr spawn in that tributary. And I believe, actually, they, they captured that fish before it went up into the river. And they had a weight on it. And then it was recaptured uh, a month later in the river. And it went up past the pit array and then come back to the main river. And it, was, it had decreased in weight. So they suspected it had spawned up there as well, so, which is speculation, but possible. <laughs> Great. All right, well, I'd like to thank everybody for coming out.